Hey everyone, today we are looking into Carl Tanzler, a German-born radiologist who settled in Florida in the late 1920s and who had a relatively normal life on the surface. But looks can be deceiving and he's remembered historically owing to a bizarre obsession which he developed with a patient, one which continued long after she died. This is his story. Carl Tanzler, who later listed his own name as Count Tanzler von Kolsel in the United States, was born in the German city of Dresden on the 8th of February 1877. Little is known about his early life, but evidently he had a lengthy education and qualified as a medical doctor at some time in the 20th century. Thereafter, he left Germany and travelled to Australia, where he lived fairly peacefully for the better part of a decade. One account on his life gives us a better insight into his time in Australia. It states that, many years ago, Carl von Kolsel travelled from India to Australia with the intention of proceeding to the South Seas Islands. He paused in Australia to collect equipment and suitable boats and to become acquainted with prevailing weather and sea conditions. However, he became interested in engineering and electrical work there, bought property, boats, an organ, an island in the Pacific, so that he was still in Australia at the end of 10 years. In 1914, Tanzler had been working to build a transocean flyer. However, as the First World War had broken out, and being a German citizen in one of the ANZAC countries, which stands for Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, he was detained and placed in an internment camp for some time during the long-running conflict. After this, he was removed to Trial Bay, a castle-like prison on the cliffs, and there he continued his work. Once the war had ended in 1918, the Australian government took the decision that anyone who had been detained during the conflict as a foreign prisoner should not be allowed to stay, and so in the late 1910s, he found himself being forcibly extradited from Australia back to Europe, where he arrived to Holland. From Holland, Tanzler made his way back to Germany, and he searched for his mother, whom he had not heard from since the beginning of the war. Gladly, she was safe and well, and Tanzler remained with her for three years, witnessing the chaos and tragedy that followed in the wake of the Great War. Then he soon married Doris Schaffer, Together they would have two children, Ayesha born in 1922 and Clarista who arrived two years later in 1924. However, Tanzler saw little prospects for himself and his new family in post-war Europe. He had also been in communication with his sister, who was living in Florida in the southeast of the United States. Convinced by her of the opportunities offered in the sunnier climes of America, the Tanzlers emigrated in 1926. They first sailed to the Havana in Cuba, and then went on to Florida, where they settled in Zemfri Hills. Curiously, it was when he first arrived in the United States that Carl first used the name Count Tanzler, telling a story that he was a relative of the Countess of Kolsel, an 18th century lover of the King of Poland, Augustus the Strong, whose ghost apparently visited him regularly during his childhood. According to Tanzler, during these visitations, he was confronted by visions of a face of a dark-haired woman that would one day become the love of his life. Shortly after they arrived to Zephyr Hills, Carl left his family there in order to take up a position as an x-ray technician at the Marine Hospital in Key West, in the south of Florida. Little was known about his work here during the first few years, yet this would change due to the arrival of a certain patient with which his name has become synonymous. On the 22nd of April 1930, Maria Elena Milagro de Hoyos, a Cuban-American woman, entered the hospital. She was the daughter of a cigar maker and a homemaker, and had been raised in a large family. On this particular day, her mother had brought her to the hospital as she had been feeling ill for some time. Tanzler was apparently struck by her from the moment she entered his clinic, as the young woman 
bore a striking resemblance to the apparition of the woman he claimed had visited him ever since his childhood and was allegedly meant to be his one true love. Tansler was transfixed by her immediately, but the young woman's diagnosis upon her medical examination was troubling. Elena was suffering from tuberculosis, an infectious disease caused by bacteria, and for which there were few effective medications or treatments available in the early 20th century, making it typically fatal at the time. Moreover, Elena's cause was probably not aided by Tanzler himself in the months that followed. He had no particular training in how to deal with infectious diseases, such as tuberculosis, but his obsession made him determined to try and save her life. As a result, instead of turning her care over to someone more suitably trained, he saw to it himself, and developed a series of specially devised tonics and medications to try and treat her condition. His obsession with her was also exhibited in the presentation of regular gifts to her of jewellery, clothing and other items, as well as expressions of his love, though there is nothing to indicate that she reciprocated these feelings in any way. Eventually, Elena died a year and a half later, on the 25th of October 1931. Indeed, the disease and its contagious qualities, as well as its lethality, ensured that several of her family and extended family also died from it in the years that followed. An alternative theory though, is that Tansler, in an effort to ensure that he would not lose contact with the woman he became obsessed with, actually poisoned her gradually, using a solution composed of the root of wolfsbane and aconite diluted. The evidence for this theory is questionable however, and it seems most likely given the fate of her other family members, that Elena did simply pass away owing to her tuberculosis. But while Elena was dead, Tansler's obsession was not. In the aftermath of her death, he had agreed to pay for Elena's funeral and burial in Key West. He spent elaborately on this in order to provide a raised tomb in a cemetery, and for the next two and a half years, he would visit here nearly every evening. However, it would soon all become even more obsessive. One evening in April 1933, the doctor made his usual trip up to Key West Cemetery to visit Elena's mausoleum. Tanzler had paid for her expensive tomb, but one of the things that this had involved was him having a key to the tomb itself. He was clearly not in the best of psychological states by the spring of 1933. He later claimed that Elena's ghost had been appearing to him regularly during his visitations there in the early 1930s. Moreover, he had recently lost his job at the clinic in Key West under unknown circumstances. Additionally, he had recently gone some time without visiting Elena's tomb, and the reason was that he had been planning something quite dramatic. On this evening in April 1933, he removed her decaying body from the tomb and placed it in a toy wagon which he had brought with him, and then he took it home with him. Once there, Dr. Tansler was confronted with the macabre problem of a partially decayed corpse. This he began to remedy by attaching some of the disconnected bones together with piano wire and other materials. He fitted glass eyes into her eye sockets to act as a replacement for her natural eyes, which had decomposed by this time. And as the days and weeks passed, and further parts of Elena's body decomposed, he replaced parts of her skin with a mixture of silk cloth, hardened with an outer layer of wax, and some plaster of Paris that would be used for making casts. Tansler even went so far as to start fashioning a wig for the body as the hair continued to fall away from her skull. Some of this hair came from Elena's mother, which Tansler had obtained and kept. Most bizarrely, he filled her stomach and chest cavity with cloth and other textiles to preserve the impression of a normal human form, and he even dressed the body. Most shockingly, he then used various disinfectants and preserving agents to make the corpse somewhat hygienic, and splashed perfume on it 
to mask the odour of decomposition. These preservation methods were carried out in an old aeroplane near his house, which the doctor had repurposed as a makeshift medical lab. Now, here is where things get even stranger. Over the next seven years, Carl Tanzler slept in his bed with the corpse of Maria Elena de Hoyos, but rumours were circulating around Key West as well. Rumours about the strange reclusive man who was often spotted buying women's clothes and perfume around town. There was even one story of a local youth who had seen the doctor dancing in his house with what appeared to be a giant doll. Eventually, the de Hoyos family heard these rumours and believed that there must be something to them. One day, Maria Elena's sister, Florinda, heard further rumours of the doctor who had treated his sister ten years earlier and who had insisted on paying for the tomb to which only he had a key. All of this made the rumour that Tanzler was sleeping with a corpse at night all the more believable. Thus, she travelled to Tanzler's home and confronted him in October 1940. Having entered the house, she saw what she believed at the time was a life-sized effigy of her sister that Tanzler had made. Afterwards, she alerted the authorities and it was only later when they intervened and entered Tanzler's house that it became clear that this was actually the heavily doctored body of her deceased sister. As a consequence, Tanzler was quickly arrested and was charged for what under the circumstances was the most obvious crime he was guilty of, grave robbing. Tanzler was now to be tried for grave robbing, even as an autopsy was carried out on Maria Elena's corpse to see exactly what he had done. Suspicions that he had engaged in necrophilia were raised, but it could not be proved and under questioning, Tanzler did not admit to doing such. Eventually, once this process was complete, her body was returned to Key West Cemetery where it was buried in an unmarked grave to prevent any further interference with her resting place by Tanzler or anybody else, as the story had gained some notoriety by this time in South Florida. A psychiatric evaluation of Tanzler followed. This determined that he was mentally competent to stand trial on the charge of grave robbing, but the case soon collapsed as it was argued that the particular charge fell outside the statute of limitations, as it had occurred over seven years earlier, and since no further charges were to be brought, Tanza was effectively made a free man. Curiously, throughout all of this, Tanzler became a subject of some sympathy in media reportage of the event, a result of his actions being construed as those of a hopeless romantic. Following the collapse of the trial and the reburial of the Oyos' body, Tanzler moved back to Pasco County in Florida near Zephyr Hills, where he had left his family back in the mid-1920s, shortly after arriving to the United States. Surprisingly, Despite his abandonment of them and his rather questionable behaviour in the interim period, Tanzler was given some financial and material support from his estranged wife. The last years of the self-proclaimed Count's life were equally peculiar. Having been separated completely from Elena's corpse, he is alleged to have constructed a life-sized effigy to act as a replacement, one which he lived with until his death on the 3rd of July 1952 at the age of 75. This was replete with a wax death mask. His body was only discovered three weeks later in his home, by some accounts, lying next to the effigy he had constructed of the woman who became his obsession. Unsurprisingly, given the strange nature of his life and obsession, Tanzler and De Hoyos' story has been retold many times in the years since, most notably a HBO documentary in 1999. While a display highlighting the story has been introduced to the Martello Gallery, Key West Art and Historical Museum. Thank you so much everyone for watching this video on Carl Tanzler. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, be sure to leave me a like and comment down below what you thought of the story. If you're new to the channel, it'd mean a lot if you could subscribe and I hope you guys have notifications turned on so you get all my videos as soon as I upload them. Anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see all of you 
in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.